OK, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. It's quite interesting to see how um, people do manage to make a time slot or don't manage to make a time slot. It becomes, you know, uh, part of what we do. And yet uh, I think there is an element of fatigue when we don't take a break in between. But today is definitely not a break. I want to thank Dr. Krauss for coming along uh, and giving of her time and expertise this afternoon. I really appreciate that she took us up on the offer. And I don't know if any of you heard earlier who introduced herself to Yanis, but I'm going to ask her to introduce herself to us and uh, tell us what she um, is busy with at the moment or what she has done or whatever she else she wants to use to introduce herself. And uh, then we'll get going with the afternoon. And um, we love your interaction, especially since it's a small group. Um, we're really happy to hear your thoughts. Please put them in the chat if you like, and I will um, tell Lizelle if she can't see hands up or chat as we go along. Right, Lizelle, over to you. Thanks for coming along. Um, thank you, um, and um, hello everybody, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, uh, to say that I'm a, a expert in this um, is 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 not true, but you know, um, if we don't grab opportunities to learn more, we will never we will never get to that. So my experience is I'm a nurse educator uh, or a professional nurse by by profession, and I joined WITS in 20. Well, I was clever. I joined WITS in December of 2013, so I needed immediately got leave, um, so I didn't have to wait. Um, so yeah, I um, did my master, completed my masters in 2015, got uh, in in nursing education with the interest in clinical um, teaching and simulation um, and where reflection and debriefing and all of these things are part of. And then I've last year I completed my PhD on curriculum development. Not that that means anything. I'm not the expert. I'm still learning with all of you. So please, if you've got a different viewpoint or a different idea, um, uh, please share them and correct. And we, like I said, we all learn together with one another, from one another, about one another. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, I am going to share my presentation. And like I said earlier, this is one of the things that I'm not very good at in uh, uh, doing presentations with uh, PowerPoint. Um, now I've shared the wrong thing, sorry. It was supposed to be my... Let me just open that, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. Can you see the, the PowerPoint presentation? Not yet, but we'll wait a little. Did you press the up arrow, Lizelle, next to the leave button? Yes. I sometimes wonder why they put it there, because the chances of you pressing leave by mistake are actually quite high. Uh, is it still not showing? Okay, still not showing. So just jump out of where you are and go back into the up button. Let me just... Okay, let's go back in there. I want to share my window and I want to share my... PowerPoint where it should be showing now. Okay, yes, we're with you now. It is showing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, today we are going to talk about debriefing versus reflection in interprofessional education, but more importantly, how to assess, especially the effective domain through reflection. And you might wonder why I shared that one article with you. Um, I thought it was very interesting how they um, show the differences uh, between debriefing and reflection, because we sometimes think it's the same thing, but in actual fact, there is some slight differences um, to it. So I'm not going to refer um, to the article specifically, but I think it gives you a good background um, into understanding our topic of today. So, interprofessional education, we all know, 
that basically we are doing these uh, uh, activities for students to get opportunities to learn um, together from one another, about one another, um, with one another, but ultimately to gain the competencies um, that is listed on the, on the screen and working collaboratively to achieve the best outcomes for patients and um, for the organizations. But the question still remain is how do we know that the students actually learn and achieve these competencies and meeting the learning objectives that we set for them um, through these activities um, into professional activities. So the question who holds the mirror when it comes to debriefing and reflection. And uh, before we going to, before I'm talking too much, I want to ask you, what do you think is the characteristics of debriefing? Um, and how does it, uh, what kind of activities can we do when it comes to debriefing? Who wants to share their thoughts? Okay, everyone's terrified of saying anything. So, <laughs> yay, Anastasia, go ahead. Um, so my thoughts, um, Lizelle, thank you so much for this. Um, these are two activities that I think I do, but I'm really curious to know, you know, what um, essentially these um, mean. For me, debriefing is um, a session that would basically look at um, an event that has happened or about to happen and um, consider the um, the participants um, expectations met or met um, if it's if it's um, retrospective or if it's prospective what they think they're hoping um, to happen but I think a proper debriefing um, um, from the from the my earliest experience of that is that it happens after an event and the the, the participants literally talk through what they they felt or um, wow. emotive um, experiences have been reflection um, I think like you have with the mirror or the looking glass literally looks at um, a person's um, where they are, where they are currently at, and when they see where they are currently at, then they can compare that to what their what um, set goals are and how they hope to get there. I hope I haven't rambled on. <laughs> No, that's that's very good, and 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 we're on the same train. So, uh, Anastasia, thank you for for your contribution. Anybody else that wants to add anything or want to say something specific, especially when it comes to assessment, can we assess any of these, and what should we assess? We're also happy to hear if you don't think there's a difference between them and if you've never thought about anything else around them. <laughs> so <laughs> Stephen will go first and then Anastasia. Thanks, Shira. Um, we do use uh, reflection in our assessment quite a bit. Um, and this is because we've, we're trying to move away from um, exam and test-based um, assessment um, and work on get, getting students to compile ev evidence of their learning um, across um, the duration of a course. Um, and a key part of this is not just what they have learned, but um, how their learning has changed um, and what um, the content has done to shift the way that they think about things. Um, and part of that is experiential. Um, and I guess um, that there could be a link there to debriefing, but we don't, we, um, I, I don't think um, we put our students in, in in those kinds of circumstances where we want them to to um, create a, a safe space for them to think um, about something that might have happened to them or um, or um, they might uh, be exposed to. Um, but it definitely can play a, 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 an important role um, in students learning over time. 
Stephen, I think you can actually take over the presentation because you've summarized exactly what I've what I'm going to present in in in, in one short um, um, uh, two minutes. So so thank you, um, uh, Prof Cook. Well, I'm encouraged by Shira's um, well encouragement that uh, we should we should engage and about what we don't know. Um, is that a fun way? In the sense that um, you know, I I have been. Um, uh, toying with perhaps the the discipline of IPE for for a little while, um, starting off with with some work we did with the Nelson Mandela University around the establishment of their their medical school. At the time, we were looking and and recognizing just how difficult it is to to um, well the difference. It's so important a topic and the differential between how important it is as an IPE and IPL into professional learning. And assessing it is so vast because it's so difficult to assess appropriately. And we we were we 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 used a couple of tools at the time and since that were were tools that looked at um, were, were, were sort of um, there were rubrics used in an observational space of observing a team working together in a collaborative um, sense around and and measuring different competencies either. The WHO or the or the um, the Canadian linked um, sets of competencies, but deep, but but reflection and and debriefing, they were never on our radar at the time. To be frank, and and I'm I'm just wondering why, um, because they they would have well. I'm looking forward to hearing as to how as to how they might um, they might have been helpful for us at the time and and now going forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and yes, um, I think we are sometimes uh, think, uh, um, not considering the, the, the aspect of reflection or even uh, debriefing, but we actually are doing things. So to just summarize um, some of the things, if we look at debriefing, it's usually after um, an event or an, a lesson or an activity. Um, it's done as a group together. It's guided by a facilitator, and um, that person is asking specific questions around what went well, what could be done differently, and what are the learning points on performance. And it's an opportunity to give constructive feedback to improve the um, performance and identify perf uh, performance gaps. But when it comes to assessment, um, it's not really uh, um, used as an assessment tool, but rather um, just for the student to gain insight on their own um, uh, part that they played in the role. However, when it comes to reflection, and maybe I must just go on to the to the next uh, uh, screen. Um, so that's the debriefing features. And there you can see it is uh, um, a guided, facilitated, scaffolded by someone. Um, so it's always there's somebody that's leading the discussion. It's not uh, done by, uh, on, on your own. It's not self-directed. It involves a part of looking back, but it's looking back at the immediate um, uh, um, past. It's not looking back into the far distance, far away, not when you were born. Um, it's intentional and it relies on open communication and sharing between the group members. So just some thoughts around that. Then when it comes to uh, reflection, um, it is more individual. It's looking inwards as to what did I learn? How did I, how can I grow from this? And what are my experiences in responses? So looking at the emotional and physical um, responses to, to the event. It happens over a period of time, like Stephen was saying, it's, it's you can have checkpoints um, in between, but you are um, gauging the student's growth from when you're starting and then you assess how they are growing, what, how, how are they gaining insight into their own learning process and what are the learning um, that they experience or, or uh, um, prioritizing for themselves. So basically, depending on the activity, um, there might be some guided reflective questions to stimulate the thinking, but at the end it is to establish critical thinking. And as an assessment, um, reflection is used um, both as a metacognitive strategy and a formative assessment strategy because it encourages the student to think about their thinking. Um, so yeah, 
that is that's reflection. Um, so to see how they are growing um, and it's introspective. So how do we teach reflection or why? Why are we using reflection? So reflection is um, like Finlay has, has described it. It's a, a reflective practice is learning through and from experience towards gaining new insights of self and practice. And basically what we are trying to do is uh, we establishing a process um, to promote the interpretation of the experience and promotion of cognitive and effective learning. The students should be asked to think critically about experiences by looking back on the implications of the actions and connecting the conclusions that they've made for future actions and societal contexts. Um, and there are very um, different models um, that you can use, but you can see all of them from Gibbs to Colt to Sean's um, uh, um, uh, uh, cycles that they have. Is it starts off with what am I uh, uh, answering the question? What happened? Um, how am I feeling about it? Um, so what about this? And then where am I, am I moving from here? So where to next? And, and some might be more um, um, simple, but at the end of the day, it follows the same process. If you look at Sean's work on the right hand corner, the reflection in action and reflection on action, that's basically where simulation is coming into, into play. And we are using, you can use the debriefing part of it um, more, more um, in detail. Um, but now, again, the question is, should we assess these reflective um, practices or activities that we are giving our students? And yeah, um, there are lots of thought of tra or thoughts um, around the assessment, and there are very various models that are um, existing at the moment um, that you can see or can find, and it all depends on the purpose of your um, assessment or activity. Uh, why are you introducing the reflection? What is the student reflecting about um, that will determine to what depth you are going to um, assess that? So most of them are using a scale. Ooh, and I do apologize for my dogs in the background. They're enjoying my, my voice. Um, so um, Hannon um, um, or Hatton and Smith, what I like about their basic uh, uh, description or a model for assessing is the, di uh, the distinguishing that they make between what is just a description of an event, um, but it does an, and reflection about the, the event. So when we are bringing in reflection, then we are giving reasons for or the emotion or why we think we experience it in a certain way. Um, so that was just um, for me uh, an important thing to to highlight for you uh, under the first one. Ash and Clayton are giving you assessment criteria, so you can actually then use a, a, a designer rubric. But important enough to to note here is that if you are you um, choosing your assessment criteria, it has to be fit for purpose. Um, if you are doing um, a, a reflective essay for you want to see how they are, what is the emotions and what did they experience, will the way they spell or the spelling of the words, is that going to be uh, uh, important to assess or is it more about the emotion and um, uh, can you derive other insights from the essay and how they write it? Um, should the mechanics then be, be a priority or not? So that is just important to, to look when you are using um, assessment criteria and a rubric for, for your assessment. You can assess on, on professional development. Um, and it's basically, again, uh, um, uh, starting with, um, do I just give a report about what happened? Do I bring my own experience and my own values into this? Um, do I, um, uh, or am I going to say that this is, I'm committed to reflect and really think and do introspection as to what is my role in this? Or am I just going to um, give a, a broad, a, brief overview with some emotion, but not really depth to it. 
And then a pragmatic approach, this is where we get to a bit more stages. So it's breaking down the, the effects or the, the challenges. So now it's giving you um, a few more uh, uh, options um, to, to use. So describing the event, uh, repeating details without offering any interpretation, up to involves judgment. And this is where your debriefing comes in. And maybe you can ask them to debrief first and then go and write the, the um, uh, reflective essay or journal entry. What went well or didn't go well? Why did it happen? Why did you feel about this? And then finally, if they can say how they can change their behavior in future to have a different experience and give some justification to it, then they can get the top mark for this. What we want to produce to, uh, or show to you today is, uh, is, is one of the um, assessment uh, tools that we've been exposed to at one of the SAHI conferences in 2019 where the Griffith University have developed an effective learning scale. And they start off to say that um, uh, effective learning um, is all about the development of values, attitudes through the recognition of the emotional responses to the learning experience. And they are able to examine their own value systems and develop worldviews that are aligned to, to healthcare. So that's what we expect from our students. So not only do they need the, the knowledge about the profession, um, so that they can um, evaluate and and um, uh, attach some understanding to it, but they also need to understand how do they as a person feel about it and how does it align with their own value system in life. They've used the Crothwell's levels of effective learning and I'm sure you have all are familiar with, with, with this um, levels, the receiving, the responding, valuing, organizing and characterizing. Um, and I'm going to pause a little bit here and come back to you and, and ask you to say, um, what do you think is, is, is uh, attached to receiving, responding, valuing, organizing and characterizing before I share the scale with you? Who wants to, to say what, what do you think a student should um, present or evidence should they provide if to say that they, they are at the basic level of receiving? Have I lost you? <laughs> Hello. Hi, Giselle. Let me just <laughs> throw my thoughts and um, I'm, I'm just going to um, reference this, the previous slide that you had shown, um, you know, with the assessments and, and, and say that my thoughts will be that looking at your different levels for the um, Crathols a receiving will be on a grade E or F. So that's a student who just repeats their experience, um, repeats um, possibly what they've been through, and they haven't really given a very nice description um, or offered any interpretation in terms of how um, passing through that event or the event um, has, has affected them and improved them or depleted them. A responding for me will be a group D, a student that has picked up um, the fact that they've experienced an event and is able to, um, there, you know, it's like there's been some stimulation and um, the, the, the outcome is that they know that this was an important event, but they really can't um, describe or or put to picture or put to page what it is um, that the, the effects of that um, experience has been. And then valuing for me will be your grade C, that they recognize how it affects their feelings, 
they've received, they, they, they're able to um, put a value to the fact that um, their attitudes or their beliefs and um, the things they've just passed through or um, if, it's, if it's an action that they're passing through, they're able to say, this is how it's affected me um, and this is how my belief um, um, has been affected by this experience. And for me, organizing is that they go beyond what's happened in grade C and they can now um, make a judgment call in terms of this went well, this didn't go well, and why um, from my from my lens or from my perspective as a student, this was this was uh, my assessment or my judgment of the experience was that it didn't go well. And I guess um, the highest grade, the characterizing will now be your grade A, that they you know go through every they experience the events, they can confirm that there's a change to their attitude, to their beliefs or to their feelings, and they are able to um, um, project this to the future and say, um, hopefully with what I've just gone through, um, this is how or this is what my expectations are. And, I, and they can give an explanation and, you know, um, I guess like you've mentioned in grade A, reference um, other articles or reference other sources. My thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anastasia. You are, are really, um, uh, you, you, you sound like an expert in, in, in this and you're absolutely quite right in your um, ex explanation of what the levels mean. So receiving is noticing um, the, the students are able to notice and attending, but they are not really um, uh, putting it into uh, the effective domain yet. They are just knowing that something is happening, but they, they're not sure or they can't express what is happening. Responding is becoming aware of their own emotional responses to the learning. And that is the first step into the effective learning. Valuing by starting to make sense of the experience and the emotional response to that. Um, organizing, they incorporate the effective learning um, into the experience and their own value system. And then characterizing is the effective learning has been fully integrated into the learner's world view and influences their professional practice. So it starts to influence their behavior or they, they change their behavior based on how they experience that. So the scale um, that we are going to look at is basically they took the five levels of, of Crothwell and added um, two more so that when they give students a, a, a journal entry or they ask the students to keep a journal entry they um, and, and reflect on the experiences or their learning experiences. And it's basically what they the, the research that they've done in validating this scale they send students into the clinical practice and ask them to come uh, to make entries um, at certain points in the in the during the time um, that they are doing the clinical training. So it can be a simulation um, um, experience, it can be a, a ward experience, it can be a community setting experience. But they need to keep um, track and and keep their diary uh, journal entries that they make. And at certain points, the the lecturers would then um, read the the journal entries and they make judgments based on on Crothwell's levels. So basically one is is going to no effective learning. So they there's no evidence of reflection. It's basically just a description of an event. Um, to receiving has noticed some aspects of the experiences that might affect their learning. So they might say it was scary. And if you think about our students, if we ask them, how do you feel about online learning last year, then they might say not for us. So at least there's some uh, effective uh, um, uh, domain or, or learning that is taking place. Responding, um, they can identify their own emotional reactions to it. Valuing, they learn something about themselves that they see as valuable or important. Organization, and we, when we were looking at some of the um, uh, diary entries, level five, six, and seven is very difficult to, to determine as to on what level do you pitch a student. Um, so 
the experience had a significant impact on the student's value system. And again, each um, value, so each person's value system are their own. Um, so who are we to decide what the evidence is that the uh, that uh, that shows a significant impact? What is the shift? Um, so you have to basically judge the shift um, in, in the students writing from where they were in the beginning um, to where they are now. Um, and that will then um, be, be considered as organization. If a student is between organization characterization, then they, they can start seeing that there is a possibility of um, specific aspects that should change. But they they they've just identified that it should change. They haven't done anything to actually make the change or change the behavior. And when it gets to the characterization, is that they can show evidence that uh, convince you that they've actually uh, changed their professional behavior by showing or giving examples of what they've done differently. So that's me. Um, before we, we we end off or go on to the next session, before I hand over to Shira, is there any questions, concerns, um, comments um, up to this point? Did I at least reaffirm anything that you've known? <laughs> Hands up would be great. Thank you, Nabila. <laughs> so what we are going to do now is, um, and Shira, I'm going to hand over to you, is that we are going to try and uh, implement some of these uh, scales on, on some of the, the reflections. So um, Shira, I'm going to hand over to you. OK, perfect. Thanks, Lizelle. Um... I was worried that we'd be too big a group and that we'd need to um, divide up. But what I think we'll do is we'll just do a couple of examples together. And what I'd really like is if people who have not seen the Griffith scale before um, could, could start giving us their opinions uh, depending on what it is that we see. So Lizelle, I'm gonna ask if I can share the screen. Yes. Okay. Um, we've got some reflections which were uh, um, requested from uh, students and they've all been anonymized. So <laughs> you can't see who they were. But the situation was the student's first day in the ward. Um, and then they had to write a reflection on what it was that they saw and felt and thought about. So let's first look at the reflection. Uh, and then what I'd like you to do is to think, if you were going to score this on the Griffith scale, um, and I think what we might have to do is jump back to that scale, Lizelle, then um, where would you put it? So I'm going to, you can leave the, 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 there are two different ones. So it says we began the day's activities with a deviation, which was quite uplifting. Okay, short orientation, we began feeding patients, which I found really interesting because it gave me a chance to get to know. And then the second paragraph was, the highlight of my day came when the unit manager asked us to spy on the permanent staff. <laughs> okay. She allowed us to interview the patients and find out if they're happy about the way the nurses are treating them on a daily basis. Honestly, our aim was to get them to snitch on the permanent staff members so that, so that what needs to be corrected can be corrected in order to ensure the patients are satisfied. Hilarious as that might sound, it offered us the platform to engage with patients on a personal level and make an effort to resolve various problems or at least direct them to those who can. Okay, so you've seen the situation. Um, maybe make some notes for yourself uh, about what actually happened. They came on the ward and they interacted with patients and 
Did she give an example of how she felt and what she thought? Okay, so now I'm going to leave that and we're going to go back to Lizelle's slide, if you don't mind, Lizelle, to present it again to get to the Griffiths scale. Okay, just go back one. Uh, okay. So here comes the fun part. I want someone who's never seen the, the Griffith scale before. So they're seeing this for the first time. Um, to tell me where they would place this kind of work. Uh, is it, and, and, and what the differences really would be between um, receiving, responding, valuing an organization. I'm not sure that, that these kind of reflections can reach level six and seven, but if we're looking at the evidence, what has the student noticed? What are the reactions? Have they learned something about themselves? Do you think that that piece that we just read scores anywhere around there. And this is the difference between classroom teaching and teaching online. People can hide behind their screens. <laughs> that is so true. Are they busy with something else? <laughs> oh, no, no, it couldn't possibly be. <laughs> um, it's a nice opportunity, oh, guys, because... The first one is this not this, so the first one we're talking about first is that there were two there just to clarify correct sure yes sorry forgive me okay yes so the the first paragraph was about when they came on the wards and they fed the patients yeah so Stephen's saying he thinks the first one is receiving and the second one could be responding but question mark and we'll talk about that question mark shortly who else wants to jump in? <laughs> Aviva, I know that feeling answering the door. So what we're looking at is we're looking at the um, at the scale again now, having read the example. Okay, two or three. Yandisa, tell us what you're thinking. <laughs> or was that hitting the microphone by mistake? I think it was hitting it by mistake. No, I'm actually looking at this whole thing and I, and I was a bit late for the meeting, but I'm doing a master's and they keep on asking us to reflect on things and I always feel like I don't know what they want from me. So I, feel ah. like I need to start this recording and actually figure out what they want from me. So this is for me more learning than it is about the students. But that's brilliant. That's exactly what we're wanting. Self-reflection as well as student reflection. So it's useful to look at a grade where where reflection is um, differentiated. It's not just this touchy-feely, I thought this and I felt that. And using a, a scale can help to differentiate where students pitch. But what you can see through the discussion in the chat, thanks for the replies, Nabila and Anastasia. But interesting, Stephen would give it um, receiving or responding, so that's two or three. Um, Nabila also is two or three. Anastasia says a three or a four. Okay, the, for sure you don't, you're not seeing six and seven. But Lizelle was telling me when, when they went to the workshop and they were dealing with several of these examples, the fight comes between what it is that you actually categorize in each level. So is it three or is it four? Um, and what makes something a five? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Prof Cook is saying maybe it's valuing. And, and it is valuing, you know, in a sense, because what she was saying was uh, it, it, it might have sounded funny that we had to ask the patients to, to tell on the nurses, but the point about it was good because we were um, trying to make the system better. The truth of it is, um, that's not an example that, <laughs> that I would have given. Certainly not a learning objective that I, learning event that I would have had students do, precisely because of this idea that that you're going behind the system. 
So complaining to somebody else about somebody else, there should be things in place for people to know whether their um, approach is valued or not. So, yeah, I mean, it's possible to criticize all kinds of exercises before you <laughs> get to them. Yeah, so she did have reactions or uh, she was, I think, being altruistic for the system. You know, um, she wanted the system to work better, not necessarily about her own learning. And there, I mean, there are lots of experiences of this. So, so I mean, to go back to Yandisa's point, if somebody asks you for a, a reflection um, with regard to even your work, then having categories like this can make a difference in deciding at what level you're giving them the reflection. Um, and I loved Lizelle's slide earlier is, is uh, what is it about the mirror that, that you want the person to see? Um, are, they, are they just coming back? So when we ask our students in, in the GEMP program, for example, for that reflection, there's a huge rubric, which all a student has to do is follow the rubric and they'll be reaching what the marking scale is. And yet, if you actually analyze the work, some of them are not reaching um, levels of reflection at all. And if we tie it back to the whole IPE story, is that if students are reflecting, what we want them to reflect on specifically uh, is their communication, interaction, and learning experience with and from other students. So would this be a way of evaluating how good the IPE was, in other words, in, in whatever experience they'd been in? Could we use a scale like this to, to score, as it were, IPE? That was a serious question, not just me monologuing. <laughs> if, if I can come in, um, I like the, the question of should we use uh, or can we use a scale like this for, for IPE? And I think um, the overall evaluation can be um, more on, yes, I learned something, something, but the student would write to, uh, have to write a reflection on, on what they've learned and how does it impact their, 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 or how would they change their behavior? Because if we think about when we are, are asking students to reflect what went well, what went, uh, what, what didn't go so well, what should we change or give us a well moment, they might just give us what we want to hear, but there's no real thought process and, and, and no internalization of, of, of the, the experience. And, and maybe that's what's missing in, in how we assess. Um, yeah, that's my thought. So I don't think uh, um, a quick assessment or a quick writing of, of the experience of an IPE uh, we'll do it justice um, to see if they 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 learned anything from the experience or gained anything from the experience. Thanks, Lizelle. Prof. Cook. Yeah, I appreciate the question because this was what I was reflecting on with when when Lizelle um, first posed the question as to uh, around debriefing and reflection, and I I just I'm wondering if. So if we look at the, the specific competencies that have been identified in the in the literature around, about the about interprofessional learning and, and the space between us where where teamwork and collaboration um, value in terms of the roles and understanding of the different roles, the communication, whether that can't correlate in some way with a, some of these higher levels on this particular scale. Because if we're just responding to what we see before us, as opposed to organizing or characterizing or even identifying the value add in that setting, then that's going to be quite, I think that, I, I, I suggest that's going to be quite a good good way to, to th this this assessment tool might be a good way to see if they've got those that some of that complexity around the IPE, the interprofessional or interprofessional learning. Um, am I am I on the right track, Shira? Yes, so that's exactly what we're trying to say. Um, and, and it's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, 
we or all of our assessments are really crafted for what's under the lamppost. It's what's easy, what we can see, what we can measure. Um, and when it comes to something that we say is desirable, but that isn't assessed, immediately the message that goes to students is, well, they say it's desirable, but they're not assessing it, so how important can it really be? And I do think we need to have these kinds of exercises where students become aware that there are ways to actually um, subjectively judge whether a student has engaged with the dimension of the exercise that we've given, not just themselves, but exactly in relation to others. But I like what Aviva has to say. If you can't see the chat, some of you, she says students give you what you want to hear very often. I know that. And it's difficult for them to be honest about their colleagues and themselves and how they influence and affect each other. But Aviva, the point that we're trying to make here, I think, is yes, that is exactly true. You've worked with them, you can see. However, if we try and help them to have some sort of structure to um, develop their comments on and to actually guide their thinking, then it might become easier for them to uh, be able to share their opinions. Um, Aviva, go ahead. Yeah, so, so in my experience with, with the GEM students, yes, it is easier for some. But it's also, you can see those superficial learners and those that really engage with the honesty of, of what they're supposed to do in an IPE exercise. And even with a very strict guided rubric, it's sometimes really difficult for them to kind of understand what it's all about. Yeah, and, and I think that that's why we need to practice. Because if we get them early, <laughs> Then, then they start to see the rhythm of what's valued and what's not valued. Lizelle, go ahead. So, yeah, it's it's actually um, um, interesting that we 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 need to uh, rethink how we how we teach because at the end of the day, we want to have reflective practitioners, and if we don't give them learning experiences um, and and teach them. Uh, and show them how to think about their own thinking. Um, they will never become uh, um, uh, independent, critical thinkers, um, making uh, judgments or, or, or share, make, or come to the point where, or get to the point where they can uh, share decision making, um, or get people to 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 see their point or influence because they they they've never looked inside or understand their own responses to to the practice. Um, I will share with this 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 group um, when preparing for this. Uh, um, session, I came about a, a woman that was very passionate about uh, the uh, uh, pract uh, reflective practitioner, and she got upset about the questions that we ask um, people to reflect on, and she lists 12 questions that we should ask our students and ourselves to become uh, reflective practitioners, and I, I will share those 12 uh, questions with you because it's actually quite interesting. Um, because that gauge us or, or gauge or, or get the student to to think beyond what is immediately in front of them. That's cool. Is that, are you are you going to put a slide up, or you're going to send it to us, or how are we um, going to share them? I will I will email the uh, oh, okay. because it's it's uh, I've I've copied and pasted, so I need to find the original source. Otherwise, I'm going to plagiarize. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I think we can send it through to Yanis for uh, the, the, for the website. The interns are doing a great job, yeah. Okay. Um, there the are two things that, that I think maybe just for winding up is worth thinking about. Over the last two days, I've watched a couple of Twitter battles happen in, in <laughs> medical education circles, um, both overseas. Uh, no, one overseas, one here. Um, don't know if anybody else has picked it up, but there was one where uh, the there was a new, very new, um, Ghani registrar who came on the circuit, and um, they were having a ward round with a particular patient, and the decision was that the patient was high risk and that they were going to take certain activities that that um, would ensure a, a safe delivery. And uh, the patient was being presented by the midwife to the team. 
And the uh, new student said to her, um, I, I don't actually agree with you that this is high risk. For this and this and this reason, um, I actually think it's fine and I don't think you need to take any of those precautions. And that caused an enormous eruption on the airwaves with a lot of people getting very huffy and saying, baby doctors take on so much of themselves and we're experienced and we're senior and I've been here for 38 years and I know and it's just ridiculous how little respect there is and blah, blah. So on the one hand. And then there came a messaging groundswell back. Um, how, how did you expect the new person to present their ideas? Often they're new and they have questions. And in presenting it, is that not the way to learn? And isn't your experience then in guiding them towards um, why you made your decision and letting them expound on why they're thinking the way they're thinking? And isn't there place in a team for all levels of experience and for people to come to consensus? So, so that was the first battle. And I'd love to hear what you think about it because I hear that quite often, uh, that, that my seniority means that I know better than you do. And that's not, I think, an attitude that, that we want to perpetuate, especially not amongst an IPE team. And the second one was, um, I surmise a gender issue that um, a, a registrar was told that uh, she came on duty with um, very fancy painted fingernails and rings. And um, she was told it was not appropriate and uh, could she go and do something about it? And the tweet was sent saying, I told this um, registrar to go and sort this out. This was the problem. And two hours later, she's still running around with sparkly jewelry and fantastic fingernails. Okay, so, <laughs> so you would think, I mean, if there's a rule, nothing below the elbow and for infection control purposes and how you're supposed to behave, uh, that's the rule. I mean, and surely you should know that when you come on duty. And this groundswell comes through in support saying, first of all, is Twitter the place to have this argument? Um, the people involved know who each other are. So it's not actually private. Um, second of all, was there any security? So was there a place she could have put her jewellery? Um, once she was told to take it off and would she spend the time taking off fancy nail varnish if she was so busy in the ward? And third of all, this is um, a male senior doctor coming down on an obvious female um, and that there's a gender issue here. So I'd love to know your opinions on whether you think in an IPE team either of those things um, are well, first of all, how, how they could be handled. And second of all, um, when people write up what it is that they're experiencing, looking at this level of reflection, how could we guide people towards reflecting on what was right about the response and what was incorrect about the response? Well, not correct or incorrect, but, but how could we guide them towards a, a, a better resolution in terms of um, working collegially? I'd just love to hear some of your take on that because I know those are situations that you kind of have seen before. <laughs> okay, is that a little bit too confrontational? <laughs> Prof Cook, save me. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, but, you know, we need confrontational. Well, we need to disrupt a little bit and, and, and get us all to think a little bit. So I'm, I'm appreciative of these examples. I, uh, the, 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 of the six, um, again, the six interprofessional competencies that are sort of, you know, recognized in the literature, conflict resolution was added as, as more recently than some of the others. Um, to, to 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 that list of competencies, and when one looks at um, at th those as at, you know the standard ones of teamwork and collaboration and um, um, communication, um, conflict resolution, th there's a. I often wonder what whether we can we can include and measure humility, because surely it, does it not always just in many ways come down to that or, or lack of pride 
so that then we all recognize the place of each other, be it a, a nurse, a physio, a clinical associate, and then dare I say it, this this godlike figure, the doctor at the at the so-called top of the pile. Um, because surely that first example you gave is is made all the more problematic because it's it's a it's a doctor who is advising the 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 midwife and there's a huge backlash because the doctor is the is is uh, is 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 pushing the is coming back at the at the midwife and and everyone's reacting to that and quite rightly because that for me so but not to go into the merits of 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 it it's just that that I agree that Twitter was never the space because that's not that when it comes to conflict resolution, that's never the space that that should be engaged in um, or not never the ideal space um, for for people to come to come to a common understanding. But to get back to the point where is it not the humility that we have to be assessing somehow or the mutual respect that we have to be assessing somehow? And how does one do that? Amongst all of these quite abstract, other, otherwise abstract interprofessional um, competencies, it's a it's a it's a fraught with difficulty. But I'm glad that people on this call are just going to come up with exactly what the answer is, and then we go forward from there. <laughs> That's a real thanks, everybody, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I I think that you you have a good point that necessarily we look at the dissonance where people are rubbing up against each other and what is the the the, the sore point and I, I do think it's important to be able to not confront them but to evaluate them in different ways and and some of the I mean we've just been looking at the Griffith scale now but some of the others that um, Lizelle gave us a little bit earlier on in the slides um, are designed to look at these types of interactions and to have people debate on both sides because there's surely good points on both sides and and the way to deal with it or what the why it turned into an ugly conflict um, and and how one could uh, mitigate against that and work against it and and obviously with the idea of good patient care at the end of it so whichever it is whatever the situation is ultimately, our goal for everybody is that that they should have um, better patient care than what I could do by myself. Um, and that would be the, the mantra of the IPE team. So thanks, Lizelle. I see you've posted a whole lot of stuff in the chat, which will be really useful for everybody. Um, so at this juncture, I'd really like to thank you for all the energy and effort you put into not only preparing for this presentation and being willing to share it with us, um, but in, in all the work you're doing in the faculty at the moment, it's really appreciated. And I'd like to wish everybody a good afternoon. And this is my one opportunity to um, advertise that we are having a faculty-focused teaching and learning day tomorrow, which hopefully you'll find an invitation to through um, Antonia in the faculty news. And we have um, extra special guest speaker at 3.30 tomorrow afternoon, and she's talking about justice um, and social justice, particularly um, in using medical education to achieve that, or health science education as a whole. So you're all very welcome for some or for all. Um, and yeah, please come along. Thanks for a good afternoon, everyone. We're done here. Just quickly, sure, if I may, is the AfriPen conference coming up, the online conference, just to flag for colleagues? Are you are, are you aware of that or, or involved? Yes, at all? yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So so our university is an institutional member of AfriPen. Mm. And um, yeah, uh, th that is something that is definitely worthwhile. Thank you. Yeah, just a flag for colleagues. Yeah. Great. But sure, thank you very much. Until is uh, wonderful. Great. And I see, Yanis, you're advertising next week already. Yeah, sorry. I also <laughs> just want to draw people's attention to next week as well. So there's a lot happening in the faculty. Um, next week, we have the teaching portfolio session. But in that, um, Rob um, will talk about having a web presence for academics. So he'll talk us through Orchid ID and academia.edu and um, a few of the other um yeah online tools and i he has sh shared some resources which i will send on 
um, by Friday or Monday um, for the session. Terrific, thanks everybody.